coined by the WHO became a buzzword. These culminating crises have further exacerbated the refugee situation. In 2020, more than ever, reliable, unbiased information can save lives. Hello and welcome to DW Academy's uh, event. I am Eddie Micah Jr. Well, I'm your host. I said we first because I was supposed to be with my co-host, but hopefully she can join me sooner than later. Now, we are going to be with you for the next coming days, 10 days. We will take you on a journey around the world, talking to experts, listening to affected people, and hear their stories about their resilience and struggle. Last year, some of you traveled and joined us in Bonn, Germany. But this year, the pandemic has changed everything, banning us or leaving us to our screens. On the upside, we're bringing our speakers to you, to your home office. You can lean back and enjoy all that we have for you. We all know that one of the important things in a conference are the discussions and networking. Although a digital solution is not the same as you know, meeting each other in person, we highly encourage you to download our conference app to take part in Q&A sessions, to schedule virtual meetings with other participants, and take part in discussions with your peers. Now, before we start with today's program, let me introduce to you Natasha Shvanka, the director of DW Academy's Media Development Department. Natasha, welcome to some of you in person in Bonn last year. Welcome, Natasha. The stage is yours. Natasha, over to you now. So Natasha is uh, is not hearing us uh, yet. Uh, we are working on on her, you know, taking the baton now. So Natasha, if you can hear us now, over to you. Give us the opening address. It is to be expected. Technology okay. within these uh, pandemic Hello, everyone. times. Okay, so once again, uh, welcome. Uh, Natasha Spanker, uh, I would like to, if to you can hear uh, me, give can you, you or say a very, very hearty and warm welcome to this conference. It's as you can see, as you can see, it's still a little, little bit edgy for me. I think, to be honest, the most difficult part is that I cannot see any of you at the moment. So um, I think a lot of this experience will be new to many of us today. Um, I hope that it will be a great experience to all of you. I promise I'll be really, really short and I will. I just want to embrace all of you and welcome you. And um, maybe just look back and say a year ago, we had a totally different situation. All of us met in person in, in Bonn here. And now we have, I think, we can, all of us can be very, very grateful and um, thankful for the opportunity that even under these circumstances, we can meet and we're meeting across the world now from uh, more than 40 countries. And to me, I'm uh, very curious and excited to see how this experience will be different to all of us. Because for myself, I can say I'm sitting in Bonn uh, it's it's quite cool today. The cat has been sleeping on the sofa for the whole day, and it's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. A lot of you are sitting, are watching, or taking part um, from a completely different context and experience. Maybe it's hot, it's early in the morning, or very late in the evening, and we will be having little bites over a period of two weeks. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see what this will do with all of us, because there will be a lot of time to, to digest and think things through and reflect before we go into the, the next session the next day for an hour every day. And I'm really looking forward to getting your feedback on all of this. Just one sentence before we go into the big uh, topic and content of this um, occasion. I think uh, what we all have experienced, and that's also very different from last year. Uh, last year, we were talking about a crisis that was not reality for a lot of us, at least uh, taking part in the conference where we were. Now we have a crisis, it's global, it's a reality in all over the place in all the countries. And what all of us have learned is that um, it comes unannounced. You can manage it, but you can't control it. 
And we have also learned that besides the pandemic, the word infodemic has become very, very important. And we know that um, communication and dialogue is one of the main um, features we have to save lives and overcome this crisis. So I'm looking really forward to all the results and discussions and the sharing of the next two weeks. We are all definitely looking forward. Thank you very much, Natasha. And hey, guys, apologies for the uh, technical hitches. You know, we we really have a lot to deal with. So we will be sorting it out as we go along. Natasha will stay with us to be part of our panel discussion, which is cooperation between media development and humanitarian organizations. That's going to be later today. But before we delve uh, into this talk, we want to take you to Kakuma Refugee Camp in northwestern Kenya. That's where we meet uh, Amina Rimo Hortens, who was a speaker in our conference last year. She made a big impression on her audience and on us, of course, with her personality, her energy, and determination. When we were thinking about who could give this year's keynote speech, we couldn't think of anyone better suited for this than her. Please welcome Amina Rimo Hortens. It's an honor for me to get a chance to be here with all of you today. My name is Amina Rimo Hortens. I was born in Democratic Republic of Congo, but because of the war, I was forced to flee my country. On that day, I lost everything. I was just a teenager. Today, I am an award-winning filmmaker, a TEDx speaker, and a co-founder of Exalki Film, a production company based in Kakuma Refugee Camp. Film changed my life. That's why I'm so passionate about telling stories for, with, and about women, especially women affected by violence and displacement. But when I fled my country, I was all alone. From the moment I started running, I find it really hard to get information about where I can go to find safety and peace. I took so many risks hoping to get food, shelter, and basic medical care. If you're lucky, you make it. And if you're not, you die. I count myself lucky every single day to be still alive. The reason why I was lucky was because I had information I needed to reach in Kakuma refugee camp safely. Living in a refugee camp, I have to depend on UNCR for accurate information and protection. However, there are gaps in what UNCR communicates. And when there are gaps, those gaps get filled by Romans. I don't like this term refugee, but let me say it loud and clear. Refugees are people like you and me. We want the same things you do. And we fall for the same misinformation as you. Just imagine yourself being alone and in a place where you don't have access to any information. What will you do? How will you feel? How will you survive? Refugee like myself live with that feeling for our lifetime. The worst part is that we don't get any information about our families and relatives back in our home. It is really painful and it's killing us slowly. Remember when Nelson Mandela was in prison? He was prevented to get information about his loved one. They wanted to torture him. Refugees are some of the most resourceful people on the planet. But the world isolates us away from mobile phone networks, away from cities, away from non-refugees, and put cruel obstacles in our way. When you cut off our access to information, you make us reliant on the goodwill of UNCR and other NGOs that share information with us. You make us disparate and most likely to come across misinformation. The COVID-19 pandemic has made this isolation even more severe. We have been told that we are in this together, that the pandemic affects rich and poor alike. That is not the reality I experienced. Refugees, immigrants, and vulnerable people have been hit much harder around the world. 
In Kenya, the camp have been on lockdown since April with no end in sight. We are even more isolated and dependent now. I don't have the answer, but I have part of the answer. We need to stop isolating refugees. I know something about breaking out of isolation because liberation is at the center of my life as a storyteller. I share women's stories in their own voices, empowering them, giving them courage, and changing how people think about us. I'm leading my sisters out of isolation. I'm seeing them and making sure others see them. As a female filmmaker, my role is to show women strength, pain, and resilience on a very big screen so that we cannot be ignored. Everyone of my film has the same thing to say. I am a woman, I'm here, and you will listen. The Western narrative of refugees only shows one side of our story, image of suffering and devastation. Women are always victim of this narrative, but it leaves behind the other side of the story, the creativity, the talent, the courage, the resilience and determination, especially of women, which affect how the world outside sees us and treats us. Refugees from Europe build the great Hollywood studios of their day. People like Alima Aden and Amy Mahmoud are also building something special in their new countries. Why don't we tell their story? Don't you see how their story are liberating? Don't you see if given a chance to a refugees like myself can give much more than what I will ask in return? This is my message. We want people who will work with us, not for us. Ending isolation in the camp and granting us full ownership of our stories and control over how our stories are told will not solve the problem we are discussing today, but it will help finding a solution together. Thank you. No, thank you, Amina. You see why Amina was an easy pick? She's uh, inspirational, but also challenges us to think about how we communicate uh, issues like displacement and migration. Now with that, we move to the next session of the program, the discussion you'll be waiting for. Yeah, you've been waiting for this for a bit. Now in today's panel discussion, three experts from WHO, UNHCR, and DW Academy will discuss how media development organizations and humanitarian organizations can cooperate better to increase the access to accurate and timely information for refugees and migrants. Yeah, now to take part in this discussion, um, uh, please go to the Q&A section right next to the live stream in our conference app. You can post your questions there and we'll pick some of them to be answered by our panelists. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, you can also tweet at DW underscore Academy and we'll try as much as possible to answer your questions. So let's uh, set the ball rolling. We're now joined by Dr. Gaia Gamiwage, who is the head of learning and capacity development at the World Health Organization. She was born in Sri Lanka, but has lived and worked all around the world. You're welcome, madam. Now, from the UNHCR, we also have the head of innovation services, Hovig Etiemizian from Armenia. Great to have you with us, sir. And uh, you've already met Natasha Shvanka of uh, DW Academy. The panel will be moderated by Marianne Casey Maslin of uh, the Communicating with, um, I should say, with Disaster Affected uh, Communities Network. Marianne, the ball is now in your court. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be back at the second year of this annual Daichi Valley Academy conference on communication, engagement, and accountability in crisis, and especially to moderate this panel, which is on cooperation between humanitarian and media development organizations. I think during this, I would ask us all to think of the conference theme and to reflect back on Amina's wonderful keynote, and the words displacement and dialogue are critical here. And in this panel, we're gonna reflect on the ongoing pandemic and especially its effects on how we talk about communication in crisis. Uh, we will have the question and answer series for the last 10 minutes. Now, Amina reminded us 
And she called on us to stop isolating refugees. I think that's a key and powerful statement. And I think really it's about the failures that we have to enable their access to information, but not just any information, information they can use. We also have decades of evidence at this stage that we need timely and accurate information for internally displaced persons and for migrants on the move, migrants anywhere, so that they can actually make informed decisions themselves, to keep their families and themselves safe. So we talked about the, Natasha, you talked about the infodemic, and of course there is a need for reliable information in this public health crisis, that's well known. And many of you on this call today will know that the CDAC network has been advocating and trying to demonstrate good practice in having more meaningful communication and engagement with people in crisis. And looking especially at having it as aid in its own right, as much as food and water, and while we've tried, I suppose, throughout the different countries and in our own countries also here during the pandemic to do this, we've often failed in some ways. So today I'll be asking our esteemed guests on this panel with me today, if the new momentum for community engagement and communication in COVID-19 can be maintained even beyond this crisis. So a very warm welcome to Natasha, a warm welcome to Dr. Gaia and a warm welcome to Hovig. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'm going to start with Natasha, as you are the head of media development uh, with the Daichevela Academy. You know, what is the vision for Daichevela Academy's displacement communication in crisis? What is that communication and displacement? Is there actually a series of visions that are changing because of the COVID crisis? And is there an evolving uh, vision for you? Over to you. Um, well, what I can say is that um, I think you have mentioned two words I would like to, to take out and say, those are the, the main components for our vision. And uh, one of them is information. Yes, reliable information so that people can make uh, their own decisions. And um, often these decisions can be very, very crucial for their futures. Um, but apart from the information, there is also the dialogue component. And uh, that's something that has often been a bit neglected in, in the past. And I think it's become very, very evident now in the crisis. Then, and I'm glad that Amina pointed it out in, in such a clear way. It's also about listening to people. It's not only about telling them um, or providing them with, with information. It's also about creating the channel um, backwards, the feedback um, possibilities. And these two components are uh, the sort of building bricks for, for what we would say is our vision in, in this context. Uh, what we hope for the future is that in, in every response uh, to a displacement crisis, um, there will be a component on communication and community engagement, but it will be a completely natural re, um, a thing to do to say, okay, we need to, to include this and build the structure and the possibilities and get the expertise right from the start. So I hope that that uh, learning will prevail. Um, that's uh, one thing. And to the, the, the part of how is this crisis in a terrible way, maybe even promoting um, that we can reach this goal. Of course, it's creating an, a common attention and an understanding of the necessity. And in, in a very bitter way, it's maybe helping the cause. Thanks, Natasha. And I'm gonna come back to you perhaps afterwards with a more political question, but let me get on to Dr. Gaia. And um, Dr. Gaia, can I maybe ask you, we're all well aware of WHO's leadership role in addressing this public health crisis. And uh, I think as the head of learning and capacity development, could you actually tell us how you feel WHO has done in this regard in terms of the critical role of communication and community engagement? And what also does WHO's cooperation with the media look like? You know, has it evolved? Over to you. Thank you, Marion, and thank you, Deutsche Welle Academy. Real pleasure to be here talking about this really important topic. Uh, what am I feeling? I've been in public health for 20 years. I was in the last pandemic. I've been in Ebola. I've been in 
many responses. What I'm feeling is that despite the devastation that is caused by this um, pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to really focus in on community engagement and really less communication and more engagement. WHO is not a community-based organization, but obviously we have a role in the conversation in making sure that reliable information gets to communities. Uh, we've all experienced now, individuals and communities are the first responders. They, have, they experience the whole of the emergency, they're the last responders. So unless we are able to, even as an international agency, able to support and work with partners and, and stakeholders and make sure reliable information is getting there, but reliable information is subjective. Uh, we have to make sure it's trusted. And for that, we have to figure out who is trusted. Then really, we're not going to make an impact. So I used to be head of risk communications. Now I'm head of learning. And now I'm looking at it together with my colleagues who work in risk communications, who's trying to figure out this infodemic with other agencies. How can we get reliable information to the front line? So this has to be First, people have to access it. And with the, with the digital technology now, many more people are accessing it. It has to be affordable. And I don't mean we're charging for information, but even to download information, it takes up money. People spend money to download information. We have to understand that. It has to be in local languages, particularly for communities, because you're excluding people. It has to be appropriate and it has to be understood on top of being trusted. And uh, unlike um, H1N1 in 2009, social media and internet technology has really changed the world in which we live. So it's not a linear, I am the expert, here is what I say, trickle down. Communities are not waiting. You're also part of a community. You're not waiting for anyone to give you anything. So I think we have a tremendous window of opportunity. You ask how we've done. Well, in terms of public communication, we communicated fast, we communicated first, and we communicate frequently. We're working with UN and other agencies at the political level, at the national level, more than 160 UN country teams are working on the same framework as us. Um, we've also done some interesting things like working with search engines and social media, Facebook and others. Whenever somebody has a COVID query, we make sure with the partnership, the right reliable information is the first scene. So we've had to do very, very innovative things that we've never had to do before. Um, but of course, we're living in a time where only 10% of our population, the Earth's population has been infected. That means 90% are vulnerable. It's not just refugees or migrants, 90% of this planet's population are still vulnerable. And after many months of the pandemic, people are losing their vigilance. Some people are getting tired, fed up. They don't want to follow advice anymore. While others, their vulnerability is increasing. So we have to deal with all of this together. So um, I'm concerned, I'm hopeful, I'm proud. I feel that we can do a lot more and I'm really happy we're having this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Gaia. And before I go to Hobart, I'm going to go back to you, Gaia, with another question, because it's linked to Hobart's next question also. As leaders on this public health response, has the current global legal health framework supported an effective pandemic response, and especially in terms of ensuring the public has clarity and certainty of messaging. We have a lot of discussion in my own media here in the rest of Ireland here on this this morning. Uh, does the international health regulation, for example, uh, speak to other branches of law, like for example, the, the newer uh, stream of international disaster law? Do they speak to each other? And is there more that can be done on the rule of law that can hold governments to account and UN agencies and uh, non-state actors over? So Marion, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, I'm not a legal expert, but as a public health uh, uh, official of World Health Organization, I, I can share with you what I know. This is a disease outbreak. It's a public health uh, event that became 
a global multifaceted emergency. So the international health regulations do apply here. And in the international health regulations, what we're trying to do is to detect very early uh, any threat to international health. You know, we're trying to get the surveillance, we're trying to get the reporting, we're trying to communicate, then trying to give a set of advice and, and trying to help all countries and all partners. So the international health regulations require us to communicate, right? So 31st of December, we were first notified and international health regulations require member states, governments, 196 around the world to tell WHO if there is a threat. So that was the date that the Chinese government informed us. Uh, by uh, 5th of January, uh, we had had that discussion and we had gone out and told all member states about this so that they could start getting prepared. Very quickly, you know, the media, uh, the media work started, the media started work. We have a director general who is a prolific communicator. He's transparent, he talks often, he really uh, does believe this is important. And of course, by, um, I think, you know, by 11th of January, we already started having public health advice. My first courses on our uh, Open WHO platform were uh, before the public health event of international concern was uh, declared. So, you know, all of these things facilitated communication. Now, another part of the IHR is country capacity building. It requires all governments to build their capacities in core capacities. And one of them was risk communication, community engagement. And uh, after H1N1 pandemic, after Ebola, we were able to uh, really push forward on this. Uh, in fact, we have the first ever WHO guideline on risk communication, community engagement. So all of these things were there. At the global level, we were able to um, activate this system. Uh, however, if countries don't have the capacity, if systems are disrupted, information is not unidirectional, uh, it comes from multiple sources. And frankly, people will do what they think is best, particularly when they're threatened. People are not waiting for scientists to say, you know, what the genome is or what the uh, case fatality rate is. They take dis uh, decisions. The refugee, um, um, the, the lady who spoke at the beginning, she's, she's looking at many risks. Is she physically safe? Is she getting water? Uh, is she subject to violence? COVID is just one more thing. So we really have to, I think, be very realistic as to what is our role and how can we help people understand better? Does it talk to other international law? Yes, it's based on human rights law. Human rights law allow, allow for derogations, limitations of human rights, right of uh, freedom of movement. It can limit the freedom of association, freedom of assembly, right? And this is why lockdowns were possible because in an emergency that's possible. It talks to humanitarian law. That, that, that is there. I think for the new body of international disaster law, disaster law is really much more at national and subnational level with international cooperation, but looking preparedness, looking at response, looking at recovery and looking at uh, uh, re, uh, you know, re-energizing communities after a disaster. Uh, is it talking enough? Uh, well, law usually doesn't talk. It, talk, it tells you what to do. But we have frameworks, Marion. I think this is the point. We have the frameworks. We're just trying to figure out how to use it. Um, accountability mechanisms for all of these frameworks we talked about, of course, are open to discussion, including um, uh, the international health regulations. There's a lot of debate about how we can enforce it the same way, how can we enforce human rights or international law? So, uh, you know, from a public health expert's point of view, um, this is how I understand it. I think we have enough laws. I think we can make better connections, but it's really about how we understand the complexity of the world we live in and how difficult it is to take a, a treaty or a set of uh, legal instruments and implement it in a line. We, we are in a web, not in a, in a, in a, in a track. Thanks, Dr. Gaia. I'm going to move on now, Hovig, to you. And Hovig, you're at the head of innovation at the UN High Commissioner uh, for Refugees Office. And, and I think you're based in Geneva uh, normally. Um, I'm going to reflect more on commitments. So legal commitments, of course, are key, but also ethical frameworks. And in recent years, 
there have been a there's been a lot of work done by UNHCR and IOM and a number of other agencies on having compacts for refugees and migrants. And the 2018 compact on refugees and migrants uh, has been rolled out or is being rolled out, I believe, currently. Uh, and really, they were saying it's for more predictable and equitable responsibility sharing, recognizing that a sustainable solution to refugee situations cannot be achieved without international cooperation and having some commonality there. And now last year on this panel, we had IOM sitting here. So we talked a lot about migrants and migration. So we're delighted to have you on the panel uh, this year. Uh, we reflected last year that, in fact, there are some differences between the two compacts, even though they both came out around the same time. And the compact for migration has a massive amount of references to information, the need for information, the need for communication, and it's really well articulated and embedded in the compact. The one for refugees is less so. In fact, the migrants one had it written about 45 times. We counted it once and then yours is about five references does that actually show a difference in the level of commitment of the organizations to refugees or is it just a, a, a different way of framing it can you talk us to that over thank you thank you uh first of all thank you very much for having me on this panel uh thank you for everyone's insights so far um i'm also eager to talk about more examples of uh, best practices that we can also learn from as we move forward. I can tell you from my also little experience in the past um, in refugee camps and displacement settings that for us as UNHCR, uh, I think it might be obvious that refugees and forcibly displaced populations are at the center of our work. And so whoever is working with refugees and displaced populations has to put them at the center, which means the only way you can put them at the center is to actually have uh, two-way communication, uh, two-way open communication. And I think by experience, I can say that whereas we're talking about COVID-19 now, uh, over time, and especially with the advancement of technology and the internet and mobile networks, already even before COVID-19, I was seeing, especially in the past six years, a spike in uh, the way both humanitarians, including UNHCR and refugee and displaced populations, are communicating with each other. So it, it, the, it was going towards the right direction. COVID-19 put us all under the extreme kind of a force majeure situation where we had to accelerate these kind of channels of communications which already existed. So, but I'm, I'm not evading your question. Uh, I'm excited to talk exact, uh, about examples immediately, but I wanna maybe touch a little bit on the question that you asked for us, Communication and community engagement is under the umbrella of what we call accountability to affected people. This includes communication and transparency, participation and inclusion, organizational learning, feedback and complaints mechanisms and response. So the Global Compact outlines those uh, commitments, ensuring access to feedback and complaints mechanisms. It reaffirm reaffirms commitments to take account of different needs of diverse communities and to strengthen engagement with multiple stakeholders. So we might not have used the same keyword, but uh, a lot of the work uh, under accountability to affect the population is about actually communicating with our people of concern. Also, I think, and you rightfully pointed out that the Global Compact clearly recognized what we already, I think, had admitted that this is not one organization doing this. So we really need to have a multi stakeholder engagements for multi-stakeholder solutions so that we address the displacement challenges of our time, but also uh, I think we will continue facing these challenges in the future. Um, the Global Compact also reaffirms engagement with refugees, host communities, the private sector and government. And I know that today we're talking about also that link with media. And I think, and I'll give a few examples if time permits on the role of local media uh, as key stakeholders in, in this engagement. Uh, I wanna maybe um, end by maybe an example uh, where this kind of, the, this renewed engagement with the private sector has yielded some results already, uh, especially in relation to communicate, communication and community management, engagement, sorry. Uh, in Uganda, our work with uh, mobile network operators uh, to expand their infrastructure, to ensure cellular coverage across new settlement areas, 
has expanded this, of course, the network coverage. And this has been critical during COVID-19 uh, with all the physical uh, distancing restrictions that were mentioned already on this, uh, on this call today. So a simple, um, I would say, engagement with private sector together with the Ugandan government allowed us to expand access to the network and reach thousands of refugees and they could also reach us. I'll stop there. For, uh, there's other examples and I'm excited to share them, but I'll give the floor back to you. Thanks, Ovik. And I'll give a quick follow-up question on that, if I may. Uh, you talked about using technology in times of physical distancing. There's been a lot of discussion in the sector as to whether or not digital communication actually will replace face-to-face -face communications, and especially in refugee situations. And can you maybe talk a bit more to the extent that it can do or not do that? CDAC promotes the principles of digital development. And I suppose we're very keen to make sure that communities are involved in the design of technologies. That actually has been an area I think that has been missed a lot in the past and especially on communications technologies. They're often introduced externally and brought in. And we're told there's yet another wonderful gadget we want to actually test on you. So we're saying, shouldn't you actually be involved in terms of the, the digital principles, uh, be involved from the start? Can you talk to that in terms of UNHCR's way of working? Over. Marianne, I think, I, like, I have a feeling when you speak that you're speaking like I would speak. So I, it feels that we've worked together already. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, for us, the work, uh, especially in the space of innovation, uh, is very much centered on co-designing solutions and not parachuting solutions. So you're, uh, you're spot on. The technology is a means to an end. It is not to be used for experimenting on anyone. Uh, it should be used together with our uh, the people that we are paid to serve, together with our people of concern, to find solutions to the challenges. That's our approach. So thank you for outlining it. Um, as a background, I just want to also kind of say that through our studies and work in the field, it is very clear to us that there are two uh, main channels of communication that are increasingly mentioned by refugees and displaced populations as their own uh, preferred channels of uh, receiving and sharing information. And those are WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. Uh, these are two tools that refugees are preferring and we are finding ourselves in a situation to actually uh, create those channels of communication so that we can actually plug into the existing ones as opposed to creating another app that everyone has to download. So we're very much attuned to this. Now, having said this, I want to mention a few things. One, we cannot make the assumption that everyone is connected. Not everyone is connected to the grid. The, uh, what I mean is the internet and the mobile grid. And some of the most vulnerable of the vulnerable are not connected. So that's one element. So we should not forget this. And therefore, we should use means to reach to those communities too. Now, also we have to remind ourselves, humans need human to human interaction. Face to face communication will never be fully replaced. So the idea that we all gonna go digital is not something that we call for. Uh, it needs to be a mix, it needs to be, it can't be one size fits all. We need to cater to the different channels of communication favored by, by different communities. Uh, now, there are also risks involved with engaging refugees and displaced populations through social media and messaging apps, including data protection, data privacy, safeguarding, etc. So we're aware of those, and you need to always have that those protection parameters so as to protect actually those conversations that we're happening. Um, and also, and I think um, I touched on it, that there is a digital give, uh, divide especially, and our research indicates this, significant access barriers to digital tools for women, people with disabilities, and older persons. So these are parameters that we need to be careful about and cognizant of. Now, talking about solutions, uh, we do see a great promise in where we can maximize the connection with offline and online worlds. For example, intergenerational information sharing with families. So from youth to their grandparents, for example those who are connected to those who might not be connected. Uh, we need to better identify who is missing from the online conversations and understand how to reach them. Can we work with 
online civil society organizations or associations to reach and engage with people with disabilities, for example. Digital tools enable us to share content in a variety of media, video, audio, images. Uh, this can increase the inclusiveness of how we engage with communities, so long as we're able to address other barriers, including digital literacy and device ownership. So we have challenges. I think we need to have the right mindset, as you mentioned, Marianne, but also we, I think, can have many solutions that we can put in place mm. uh, to make the online, offline uh, work together. Over to you. Thank you, Hovig. I'm going to head back to Natasha now and, uh, and a question that's quite linked even to what you've been talking about. Uh, and I think we're all aware that the infodemic has left a lot of space for politicization and polarization in the COVID-19 news coverage. And we've seen that such coverage has influenced public views in some countries, even in today's media, we've seen this. As a development, media development entity, uh, how has Dajvela Academy addressed this challenge and maintained that journalistic principle of the search for the truth? And have we listened enough to scientists or are we all influenced more by what politicians are saying? Over, Natasha. Thank you. Well, we try to listen to everyone, actually, because in media development, we take an approach where we say um, there are uh, several sectors involved in a, in a constructive dialogue and conversation. And of course, we do have a strong focus on the professional media sector, because uh, we're being a part of Deutsche Welle as a broadcaster, um, that's very close to us, of course. But um, Looking at that, I think all of us can see on every level now how much um, journalism and the so-called truth is challenged and how difficult it is to distinguish between reliable information, even in places where we're, we have an overflow of information and we can choose, it's becoming a huge challenge. Um, so, so finding and distinguishing this information um, and deciding whether it's truthful and reliable or even relevant is something that's becoming increasingly difficult. And uh, we focus very, very much on uh, the local media. They've been mentioned earlier already, but we see that um, local media, and sometimes they're very, very small, but still professional um, media outlets, and they're immensely important because they can not only tell the people you need to wash your hands and do this or that, they can also tell these um, communities where they can find the soap and the water. And um, translating that, the, the sort of general, first of all, sort of distinguishing what kind of information is important for whom, how can you get it to the people in their languages and how can you communicate it so that will, they will find it and understand it. Uh, Dr. Gaia had already mentioned that is still one of the most important roles of media and it's become increasingly difficult of course because um, with the scientific um, information that needs to be understood and processed now, it's become a challenge for a lot of media houses. Um, We've been concentrating on qualification quite a bit. We've been working and uh, supporting organizations and programs that are into verification. So um, that's quite interesting. There are a lot of initiatives, sometimes more connected to professional media, sometimes more civil society organizations. And it's really interesting to see what dynamic you get when you, when you bring them together to um, to uh, put this, distribute this watchdog role on more shoulders than the, the classic media had, and then um, try to find new solutions, also technically, um, to to be a, give a better um, um, how do you call it a better guidance in in this information overflow. But another pillar that's been quite important for us, and I think it will become much more in the next few months and years, is of course the, the economic survival of media. Um, it's the, the pandemic, is, I mean, there has been a huge challenge, economic challenge in the last years already with um, digital disruptor um, really posing great question marks on what are the business models 
of providing information in the future. And as Dr. Gaia mentioned, nowadays people pay for receiving the information, but not for the content itself anymore. And all we, we've all gotten used to getting information for free. Um, but how are, are, are media outlets, journalists going to economically survive? And now that um, the economic crisis is challenging this sector a lot. It's become a, one of the main fields of work where we try to, to at least support the development of new ideas and, and ways to overcome that. Was Thanks, that- Thanks, Natasha. Did yes, that that's- your that's question? Just... I think there was another part to it. I think we leave it at that for now. I'm conscious I'm clock watching at the moment. And I think we have five minutes before the questions and answers. I'm hoping the facilitators are going to, to uh, give us a nod when that happens. So maybe I, I, a follow-up question. I'm very conscious that Dr. Guy was also a journalist. So uh, while well, you might have two hats on you for this panel, uh, Guy, but maybe, um, Guy, could you maybe talk to us a bit about, is there something that Western governments and health actors can learn about communication and community engagement from disasters and the pandemic, especially from Asia and Africa. It looks, at least from the media, that it's better contained in those regions and those continents. Is there something we can be learning from there? Yeah, uh, well, yes, I was a journalist, so I, I have perspective on this and I really feel strongly um, about this. And I just wanted to link to the previous speakers to say that, you know, national journalists and, uh, for example, WHO works with the World Federation of Science Journalists, people who are closer to communities have a very big role to play. Um, so what can I say? Our um, strategy at WHO is really reduce transmission, protect the vulnerable and save lives. Now, it's very difficult to predict where the pandemic is. In fact, numbers are going up again in Southeast Asia. In Africa currently, it seems to be going down, but in many, many parts of the world, it, it's still going up. Uh, and as I said, only 10% have been exposed. So <laughs> we've, we've got a long way to go. What can countries learn? Um, I think there's a fundamental difference in countries where civil political rights are very important to the population. So if you take most Western or high, uh, or high income countries, people's freedom of, of individual rights to speak, to move, to do as they like is very strong. In, if you like low income countries, there tends to be a focus much more on economic, social, uh, cultural rights, including health. And in lower income countries, it could be in Africa, it could be in Asia, but also in Latin America, um, there are also certain cultural factors, you know, doing things for the benefit of the community, doing things for the benefit of the whole. So I think all of these things influence how a country, because it's not just a government, a country is able to manage a public health event of this magnitude. Okay. So uh, what we've seen in countries with that either autocratic or countries where there is a culture towards doing things for the benefit of others, even at an inconvenient inconvenience to yourself, it's been easier to impose, you know, um, staying indoors, wearing a mask, doing things for others, because this disease um, is not manifest as a, as a severe symptom disease for most, most people. So you really have to have a sort of a community or altruistic orientation to say, I'm healthy, but I may be transmitting it. So let me be careful. In countries where civil political rights are really valued, right? Then it be, the debate about my personal freedom, my right to do things is a, is a stronger consideration for governments. This is what I've observed in uh, 20 years of public health. So I think, you know, just telling people what to do never works. It depends on their beliefs, the context, their socioeconomic cultural background. So is there something to learn? There's always something to learn from everybody. Hovig was right. I mean, there's so much to learn, whether it's in a uh, refugee camp, whether it's in a, um, you know, a high tech, uh, uh, tech company, you know, just to see how people are managing this. But essentially it's human, it's social, it's cultural. Uh, one other thing I think is a difference between Western or high income countries and other countries is the relative risk. As we said, if you are a woman my age, 
you're worried about, well, if you're my age, you're worried about your daughter having being pregnant. You're worried about when to get the next meal. You're worried if you have enough household income. You're worried about protecting yourself from violence. Well, then again, this doesn't matter. So people assess risk based on their own lives and their conditions and their beliefs. And the ability to impose depends on the socioeconomic political conditions. Um, so it's not, it's a really roundabout answer, but it's also something I've been thinking a lot about. I hope this is added to the uh, conversation, not added to the confusion. Okay, so uh, sorry, I, ha I hate to be the one to interrupt uh, such a lovely discussion, but we normally have just one hour for all of these uh, chats. And remember, a key part of it is that you guys listening right now should be sending your questions. And talking about questions, I have a couple of them. First of all, thank you very much, Marianne, for leading that uh, insightful discussion. Let's get to our first question. Uh, this is uh, coming all the way from Malawi, Anga Somali Maliro. Uh, right. I cannot stress enough how expensive it is to access information in my own community. I can only imagine the other constraints on refugees. Uh, she goes on and on, uh, but uh, she's talking about uh, cost, expensive costs. These are costs that come with uh, one already having access to or possessing uh, digital uh, devices. Purchasing devices is a whole other challenge for many, she adds. Now, connected to this issue, Philip from Uganda is asking, when you look at Uganda right now, the government introduced a tax limiting and thus censoring people from using social media. With data costs still high in the country, people are left in a state of hearing information from hearsay. So the question is, how can we spread information to remote areas with all these challenges in place, especially during a pandemic? Do we just jump in? Anyone can jump in here. <laughs> uh, let me start. I, I, really, I, I feel very passionate about this, uh, you know, because I, I think we produce so much information, great stuff, but we are really not working enough to make sure it is accessible. One, one good example following Hobig's uh, approach is the International Telecommunications Union is working with governments uh, in many, many African countries and other countries to really look at expanding uh, uh, coverage and reducing costs. So, so I, I think there are systematic and infrastructure and government led things that have to be done. But on the other end of the scale, we can go back. We, we are human. We have to connect with other people. We used to live in communities of no more than 150 people. And we functioned by those relationships. And by having 10,000 friends on Facebook, we sort of lost sight of that. So we have to engage um, people who are closest to the community, whether it's a healthcare worker, whether it's the religious leaders, whether it's a youth association, whether it's women entrepreneurs, we have to get it where we can get it. And we have to help people to have conversations. It is not about transmitting information. Information forms a basis of knowledge, which forms a basis of intelligence, which forms the basis of sense making and decision making. So we have to have conversations with people whom we can access and we have to empower them, train them, equip them, give them what they need so that they can continue the conversation. And the best example is community radio. If you can get nuggets of reliable information to community radio, the conversation will start. And there's lots of research about how people trust information. And we, we, we have the know-how. We have to have old and new. As Hovig said, technology is a tool. We, we have to, and what we're doing is digitally enhanced communication, okay. not digital communication. Okay, now um, uh, there's, there's one interesting question coming from uh, Anouk Bello Bukat uh, from the Canary Islands. Uh, he asks, uh, do you believe that interpreters and translators work is key while aiding refugees and asylum seekers? Do you believe there should be more being done to provide sufficient and appropriate linguistic aid, he adds. Maybe I can jump in, Marianne, if you allow me. Am I allowed? Feel free. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to kind of uh, touch on also Dr. Gaia's point and give an example uh, in, the, in, in, um, in South Sudan, in the in Jamjang refugee camp, we're actually working with the local radio and refugees are involved in creating, uh, besides just the messaging, drama series on radio to depict uh, challenges, but also uh, 
bust some myths about refugees. So this is a, it's a good example. And the last question is extremely important because language, so interpretation and translation, that question is a, actually has a broader window to it. Language and language barriers are one of the key um, issues that we like to address. The use of local language and uh, you know the importance of humanitarian agencies not to go beyond English uh, and into using and in, uh, local languages is extremely important. We heavily rely on interpretation and translation in the work that we do. So uh, I fully support that uh, the work of interprets uh, is extremely important. But also, this reminds us all that the languages we use, the language we use with communities, uh, and let's not only think about the written language, let's think about all these vulnerable populations with disabilities. So we're not only talking about translating, we're talking about interpreting, we're talking about um, visually impaired people and how we can reach them. So language is, you know, it, it's a very good question because language is key in, uh, in this challenge that we're facing today. Over to you. Okay, over to me, and I wish I could say over to you again, but uh, time is not really on our side. For those of you uh, that also asked questions, uh, there will be definitely a chance to keep interacting with the panel and uh, folks that are involved in this whole uh, two-week event, so uh, you can definitely have the chance uh, to talk. So many thanks to you. Um, and let me just uh, acknowledge again Dr. Gaia Gamwage, who is the Head of uh, Learning and Capacity Development at the World Health Organization. Also from the UNHCR, we had uh, uh, the head of innovation services, Hovig Etiemazian from Armenia. Thank you very much for that. And also our very own Natasha Svanka, who is the director of DW Academy's Media Development uh, Department. Many thanks, all of you. And of course, Marianne, many thanks for doing such a great moderation. Well, tomorrow we'll pick up the pace a bit. Seven speakers will tell you in seven minutes each about their projects and ideas. It will be a trip around the world and unfortunately, there won't be time for questions, but no worries. The speakers will be available for you on our conference app after the session. So just go over to our website, dw.com, for details on where and how to download the app. That's the only way you can take part in the Q&A sessions. And uh, that's scheduled uh, virtual meetings also. You can do that uh, with other participants and create and take part in discussions with your peers. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure. I am Eddie Micah Jr., your moderator for today and the coming days. And uh, yeah, have a good time and see you tomorrow.